This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. OK, we're going to take a look now at accounting for convertible debentures and then accounting for derivatives. You met convertible debentures when you were studying financial reporting. So they were in the syllabus there. But it's one of those areas where people seem to forget the rules. So I will go through them from scratch. Remember, a convertible loan or a convertible debenture is a loan that can be converted into shares. So let's just pop that down first. Convertible debenture, a loan that can be converted into shares. We look at this from the perspective of the person who is borrowing the money. So we're very much on the credit side of the balance sheet. So you might perceive that as a loan with an option to have shares instead. And that's the logic behind the accounting treatment the accounting treatment is that you should use some form of split accounting. In other words, part of the credit is regarded as liability and part of the credit is regarded as equity. So we use split accounting. As it says in your notes, it's perceived this in substance as a combination of equity and liability. So if you think about liabilities, liabilities always have to be measured at fair value at the start. So the liability element does regard, does require an element of calculation. That calculation again is to measure the liability at fair value. The reality is that if a company would normally borrow at say 7%, if they're offering a convertible loan, they'll be able to borrow at a lower rate because the investor knows they've got the chance of a bit of excitement, the possibility of swapping the loan for shares and maybe being as rich as that person in charge of Amazon. So you have to calculate the liability. The equity element is the difference between the money you get and the liability. Remember the different, the definition of equity is equity is a residual interest. So some would say it's a balancing figure. That's fine. The reason it's a balancing figure is because equity is always an in a residual interest, what is left over. Later on, so this that's what happens, if you like, at time naught. Shall I put T naught? Time naught, that's what happens on the date the instrument is issued, the date the money is borrowed. Later on, the liability will be accounted for at amortized cost. That's just regular liability accounting. And the equity never changes. It's a bit like if you've studied share-based pay, cash settled share-based pay, you have to keep remeasuring the liability. Equity settled share-based pay, you don't remeasure the credit to equity. So looking at the keywords so far, time naught, liability at fair value, equity, a residual interest or balancing figure, time one, one year later, liability, amortized cost, equity, not subsequently changed. Now, the only thing that can confound these a little bit is if you've got issue costs. You know with liability accounting, 
that issue costs must be deducted from the liability, well, in fact, you've now got both a liability and an equity, so you have to do an element of prorating of those issue costs. I'll show you that in this example that's coming up in a minute. So let me just write here, see below. If you want, pause the recording so you have time to read example three, and then we'll very gently take our way through it. So we have to look at the position initially when the convertible debenture is issued and then later what happens over the subsequent years. Initially, I just want you to notice two interest rates, 4% and 6%. So normally the company borrows at 6%. In this case, they're able to borrow at 4% because they're giving the investor an extra surprise. The extra surprise is to swap the loan for shares and perhaps one day to all be millionaires. Don't worry for a moment about the issue costs. Don't worry about the other interest rate. So let's have a look at this example three. Let's have a look at the date of issue of the convertible loan. So this is what's happening on the date of issue. When the money is received from the um, investor, if we just think in million dollar terms about what's going to happen, Cash will go up. How much is it going up by? Well, it looks like 100 million. But in fact, they actually have to pay issue costs of 1 million. So they're only going to receive 99. So the debit to cash is 100 minus 1. That's the issue costs of 99. Part of the credit or increase is against the financial liability and the rest is against equity. Again, remember, we said before, liability is initially measured at fair value, equity a residual interest, which means a balancing figure. So that's what we're looking at. In order to measure those figures, well, we need to do a working and the working effectively again is to try and sort out the fair value of the liability at the date of issue. That needs a little bit of discounted cash flow, which you learned when you did financial management. It's not very hard. So I plot the number of years this is a loan that we are assuming lasts for three years. I'm now going to plot the actual cash flows for the borrowing company. So how much money it actually has to pay out. The money it has to pay out is the regular coupon on this loan. The regular coupon on this loan is 4%. 4% on 100 million means it has to pay a coupon of 4 in each of those 3 years. In addition, if the loan has to be redeemed, they'll also have to repay the principal. I now need to bring that to fair value. So I need to use some kind of discount factor. When I do that, I use what would be the normal borrowing rate. The normal borrowing rate on the loan is 
6%. So 1 over 1.06, 1 over 1.06 to the power of 2, 1 over 1.06 to the power of 3. Then I can bring that back to present value. So if you do the calculation, again, it's not too bad, is it? I'm going to go to one decimal place. And if you come out kind of 0.1 different, don't worry. I think that's 3.8, 3.6, 3.7, 3.8. So the initial amount of the liability would be 3.8 plus 3.6 plus 87.3. If I add that through, I think I'm getting 94.7. So of the 100, 94.7 is credited to liability. So 94.7 is credited to liability. The rest will be credited to equity. How much is the rest? Well, the rest is the 100 minus the 94.7, which I think would be 5.3. Now, those two numbers add to 100. I now need to prorate the issue costs. And I want to stay kind of, you know, rounding. Can you see that roughly, well, it's kind of 90% of the issue costs relates to liability. And 10% relates to equity. So roughly 95, I know it's not quite there, is it? But it will do for now. Minus 0.9, minus 0.1. So what I've done there is a kind of rounded prorator. Remember what matters in this exam is your explanation. And although you don't want to get all of the numbers wrong, if you get some of them slightly rounded, no one minds. If you have no explanation, you're proverbially sausaged. So I think that's 93.8. And that's 5.2. That's the initial position on the date of issue of the liability. We'll now have a look at how the liability is remeasured over the next three years. So I'm now going to take a look at the next three years. So if I just put year one, two, three, my comment is that the liability is remeasured at amortized cost. So this is going to be a regular amortized cost working with a very slight difference. You start down with the brought down, you add on the finance cost, you knock off the cash paid, and you get the carried down at the end. So initially, the liability, we've just said we think we ought to measure at 93.8. Let's just highlight that number, 93.8. Don't forget you can pause the recording as much as you need to. Now this is where, if you're the prize winner, <clears throat> then you use the other interest rate because 
We've deducted these issue costs, so if you use 6%, it doesn't come out quite right. But don't lose much sleep. So this is the one that we use in the amortized cost working. So that's the one that we use in the amortized cost working. So finance cost will be 6.38%. Bit of a squeeze there. That's supposed to say 6.38%. Let me see if I can just tidy that a bit. So I think if you extend that, it gives you 6 the cash paid is the regular coupon. It's that number we were using back up here, the four. In other words, this is fixed, isn't it? It's the 4% of 100. 4. So at the end of the first year, 90, that's gone up by, yes, 95.8. Then we can continue to the second year, 95.8, 4. It's now gone up to 97.9. Now I think because we've done so much rounding, uh, we need to just uh, kind of fudge this last number so I'm going to put I know it's 6.2 but I'm just going to put 6.1 and again it's all because of rounding errors because we've made several roundings but hopefully you can see now that if I do take that figure I'm back to 100 at that stage the investors will either want their money or the shares. Now this very last stage at the end of the term, the examiner doesn't really ask about, but I will just for the sake of it, just say what happens at the end of the term. So after three years, you say to the investor, what do you want? The investor says they might want redemption they might want conversion. In any case, in both cases, we now get rid of the liability. Debit liability, its existing carrying value is 100. Redemption, credit cash. Conversion, debit liability, credit, well it'll be some combination of share capital and share premium. Again, um, if you're interested, but I wouldn't be that interested, I mean other reserve transfers can take place, but don't, whatever you do, go on about those in the exam because they're not interested, um, particularly because you've set up this initial balance of 5.2 and equity. So I think that can be released by a reserve transfer if the investor goes for redemption. But as I said, they're not going to bother about that. They're interested in the primary statements, initially the P&L. If you feel that under time pressure in the exam, you'd be unable to complete the calculation, then the best thing to do would just be to ignore these issue costs completely. And then on the calculation, instead of getting three out of three, you'll perhaps get two. If they just say it's only worth half a mark, they, they don't give half marks anyway, so you may end up with three. So the important thing always is it's all about explanations. But there's a recap on convertible loans. Now we're gonna look at one more thing 
Next thing in the notes is just a couple of points about derivatives. And we spoke about their definition um, before in the lectures. We said, didn't we, derivatives are things that require little or no investment. They are settled for cash at a future date and their value somehow belongs to some kind of underlying asset. Let's just start with derivatives by looking at this illustration. So read the illustration, but not the solution, just for a moment. Doesn't that sound complicated? Because you're going, what's a shot? What's a, what's, um, what is a swap? How does it work? Well, in theory, you met it in financial management. If you're doing advanced financial management, you'll be all over it like a rash. But they don't want to know what a swap is. They just want to know if it's a derivative. So just notice there, they're just making the points. No money is actually initially invested. I'll show you why in a minute. There's a cash settlement and it's all linked to some underlying variable. If you've not come across this word LIBOR, it's an economics or banking term. It's linked to the London market. It's the London interbank offered rate. It's a kind of economics interest rate thing. And you might say, well, how will I calculate the value of the interest rate swap? It will tell you. It will say the value of the interest rate swap is four. So you write four. Or if it says seven, you type seven. You don't say what's a swap. In the same way as when it says a sausage stuffing machine costs 50, you type 50. You don't say I wonder how it stuffs sausages. Now, the rule on accounting for derivatives is just up here. Very important. They can be assets and they can be liabilities. Either way, it just depends. They're always measured at fair value, which will be given in the question. You don't have to calculate it. And any gains or losses always go to profit or loss. The two points that I've written underneath, numbered one and two, about options and other derivatives, I've put in so that you're not surprised in a question. They're not going to ask you to write those rules out. But I'll just talk a little bit about those two points. I'm going to do so by just setting up a little table about the way that derivative values work. So in my table, it's a very simple table. I'm writing here options and then the other derivatives, which are things like futures, swaps, forwards. It's just so that you're not surprised now, what happens, of course, is that first of all, you enter the contract. And then later, you get to the soft P date. If you have an option to do something with a bank, an option to buy shares at 50, you've got to pay for it. And when you pay for it, you'll remember this jargon is that you pay a premium that is not an issue cost. It's a premium. You're buying something in the same way as I might buy this pen. The premium that you pay is a financial asset. Later on, the financial asset might grow in value. Or if the shares become worthless, it's worth nothing. So by the balance sheet date, you will either have a financial asset or the worst possible position is that you've got nothing.
If you're looking at the other derivatives, when you enter the contract, you pay nothing. You just have, it's like having a bet on the football. So that means there is nothing in the balance sheet. Nil value. If any of you do speculate on the derivative markets, they probably do make you pay something. That's a security deposit in case you run away. But the general principle is you pay nothing. Later on, you might win, you might lose. If you're betting on Manchester United versus Arsenal, and you've bet in favour of Manchester United, if they win, then essentially it's a financial asset. If they lose, it's a financial liability. How will you work it out? It will tell you. So you don't have to stress about this. You just have to copy the number. But you can at least say, I do remember that old sausage telling me to expect this in the question. There we are. Derivatives. Measure at fair value given in the question. Gains and losses always go to profit and loss. And that is all we have on convertible loans and derivatives.